you'll turn with me to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, you know, it's it's been said over the years that the book of Ephesians is really our promised land of blessings. And it really is. Uh, you know, so many times you you you, you maybe you uh, gravitate to you know, in the course of a year, you're studying various things throughout the Bible, and then you eventually get back to reading the book of Ephesians. And it's just amazing how it's all brand new every time you open the book. It's just stunning and astonishing how we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And God just keeps on opening more and more understanding. And so sometimes we wind up, seems like we never never uh, get too far, ne never stray too far some, from some elemental things that uh, the Lord's teaching us. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, I think Steve Tresbeck and I are both in love with uh, John chapter 14. And we keep on going back to it over and over and over and over again, because it just illustrates so many truths that, uh, that are relevant for today, for the presence of the Lord and for coming into his presence. But here tonight, we're starting in the book of Ephesians. Uh, and then chapter, chapter one, I'd like to read to you from Paul's prayer in starting in uh, verse 16. It says, he ceases not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. And here's the prayer that, that opens up the book of Ephesians. And there are things in here that, 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 that you know, you don't, they're not obvious, but, but you start to let them dwell. You ponder truths of God's word in your heart and let the, the, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit just continue to build understanding. And it's amazing what stumbles out when you, when you re just read and the, the book of Ephesians. But here's this prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, or literally who are believing. It's a present participle. According to the working of his mighty power. And of course, it goes into principalities and powers and a few other interesting, interesting things. But what Paul is opening up here are, are, is he's honing in on three things in these verses 17 and 18. And I want to draw your attention to them that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge. And, you know, we've shared before that this word knowledge is the word epigenosis, meaning relational knowledge, personal knowledge. It's not just head knowledge. It's, it's, it's knowledge based on experiential interaction with, with, with uh, uh, kind of knowledge. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know, number one, the hope of his calling. And that, that word calling means invitation. So the hope, the, his invitation, his extension to all believers being able to come into the, the, the place where he, they're in the gathering together. And to know that as something that's, that's not, just based on you, not just based on your uh, knowledge of the scriptures and, and reading about the hope and understanding what the hope is and the rapture, but your experience in Christ and your dialogue with him, your conversations with him that reaffirm and continue to, to extend to you the, 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 the reality and the mindful consciousness of the hope. So the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know, number one, the hope of his invitation, <laughs> the hope of his calling. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, this is kind of interesting because the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, it sounds like a cumbersome phrase, but what it's really talking about is his presence. When we talk about glory, the glory of God, we're really talking about the presence of God because the presence of God is his glory. His glory is his presence. Remember the the uh, priests that couldn't stand up for the, the weight of the glory that came down when they dedicated the temple for, uh, uh, under Solomon. Uh, remember Moses in, in Exodus 33, where he says, show me your, thy way. And then God shows him his presence. And then he says, show me his, your glory. And then his presence passed by in the cleft of the rock. 
His glory is his presence. His presence is his glory. And so when we're thinking about coming into his presence, the presence of the Lord, the nearness of the Lord, that it's it is literally Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so how amazing it is to just see Paul's focus here when he says that you may be enlightened, meaning that you may get revelation on what is the hope of his calling and the riches of his presence. That's what he's talking about. And thirdly, what is the exceeding greatness of his power, his supernatural power. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight is hope, presence, and power. Their interaction, their relation to each other, and how we how we can increase in all three of them. When we're talking about hope, hope is something we need to get a revelation of. And that's exactly why Paul precedes his mention of hope, presence, and power with praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you the spirit of wisdom. Spirit of wisdom, you may recognize as one of the seven spirits that's mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11. And there are seven spirits uh, that uh, hover around the throne. And I believe those are the, that's the spirit of wisdom is one of them. As you grow in the spirit of wisdom, you grow in the presence of God. You grow in, 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 in a connection with God through the spirit of wisdom. And revelation. Well, we know revelation is word of knowledge, word of wisdom is revelation, for example. And growing in the spirit of wisdom and, this, and revelation in the relational, uh, the relationship that you keep with the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship that we have with him and with the Father. And so as we launch into hope, presence, and power, it all starts with enlightenment, with revelation, and with the personal relationship that we keep with Jesus Christ. You see, there are things that the scriptures cannot, cannot unlock until we have a relationship with Jesus. There are things in the, in the scriptures. We can know them intellectually. We can know about them. We can know lots of different technical details about the scriptures. But if we don't know Jesus Christ on a personal level, then much of the Bible is is unlocked to us. Uh, excuse me, is, is still locked up from us. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That phrase being enlightened is referring to being lit up with revelation, enlightenment. Uh, and being enlightened has to do with spiritual revelation. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. The hope. Think about, you know, the hope is something that we acquire, but the hope is also something very necessary in the to the foundation of the Christian walk. If we don't have hope, we're not going to last. And matter of fact, there's some very interesting verses that that speak about uh, the hope that I want to kind of, kind of mention to you. Uh, for example, First Peter in chapter one. Uh, well, before we go there, let's go to uh, let's go to First Peter. Yeah, First Peter chapter one. <laughs> I get so excited. First Peter chapter one, verse uh, verse th uh, verse thirteen says, "Wherefore." Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you're probably like me. As we read about the revelation of Jesus Christ, we immediately think of the gathering together. But I believe it's not talking about the gathering together here. I believe it's talking about when you come to the place where you have a personal, interactive union oneness fellowship with the lord jesus christ at that revelation that's when your mind is going to become full of the hope let's read this again wherefore gird up the loins of your mind being sober and hope to the end 
for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I know this is the word apocalypto, and usually that always refers to the gathering together. But there's a continued revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is precisely what Paul was praying for in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance, which he hath called you, uh, as, but as which he hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all conversation. Because as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons is judging according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here with fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your uh, conver vain conversation received by tradition of the fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ and without spot. Hallelujah. We are born again of incorruptible seed. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. And what I'm, the reason why I'm talking about these kinds of things is that, number one, we need a revelation of the hope. And number two, that revelation can't come without relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. So think about the interconnectedness of hope and presence and power. In uh, chapter three. In verse 15, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that is asking you a reason of something that is so visible in, in when you speak, when you walk into a, the store, when, you, when, you're, when you're in the classroom or at work, something that is so obvious to you is that you have hope. Uh, there's one uh, person I've uh, been spending some time with, uh, interacting with, that is struggling and is having a lot of troubles with uh, finding job and and uh, housing situation and those sort of things. But one of the one of the biggest challenges is attitude. When we have hope, we draw near to God. When we when we complain, we drive ourselves away from God, just like in Egypt. And so many times when you're working with people, you have to teach them to praise God in the midst of their crisis. And that's a hard thing to do because they're so full of the crisis. They're so focused mm -hmm. and so anguished by the crisis of the moment. It's hard for them to get the engine of their faith to change focus and start praising instead of complaining. Mm -hmm. But the hope is fundamental to keeping us in that plane where God can do, go to work and God can help us. In, uh, in 1 John chapter 3, It says, and every man that has this hope in him is purified. I guess we'd better go back uh, and read first, starting in verse one. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. That's our hope. And every man that hath this hope or is having this hope in him purifies, is purifying himself even as he is pure. So there's, a, there's an active mechanism that's happening in the spirit realm when we hang on to the hope. And that's why Paul starts and says he wants you to be enlightened through the intimate knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And first of all, Hang on to the hope. Now, there's something else the hope does. And I like to say about hope that it really, literally what it's doing in terms of our relationship with the Lord is that it's focusing our heart. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. It's a tremendous verse in here that speaks about our relationship.
Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. It says, For this ye know, that no harmonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, why is that in there? <laughs> well, that was a good verse, whatever it was. <laughs> but it was a verse that talks about drawing nigh, nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. And when you do that, it's, it's a function of the hope. We have this hope in us so that we can draw near to God. We have this hope so that we can continue to keep our hearts in the heavenlies instead of on this earth. And when we do, it enables us to draw near to God. And as we draw near to God, that enables the relational stuff to start kicking in. So hope is what focuses our hearts to stay attuned heavenly, uh, to be looking to the heavens instead of just in the moment. Oh, thank you. John Jure just got it. James chapter 4, verse 8. God bless you, John. Let's read that. Oh, here we go. Great. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, and dub be double uh, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted more and humble yourself. Okay. Uh, I, was, I guess I was thinking of another verse, but anyway, that's a good one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God so wants you to hang on to the hope. You know, that's what keeps driving us. That keeps us focused. It keeps our hearts focused on, on the things that God wants us to be able to do. It keeps us focused so that we keep running the race without getting so hung up with, uh, without getting so hung up from the, the, the challenges of the, of this life. Okay. Thanks for your help there. I see Cheryl. She's pointing me back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 5 again. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what I was looking for. Verse 5, Galatians 5, 5. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You see, just being full of the hope, it's not just programming our hearts with our, it's not just programming our souls. There is through the spirit waiting, there is a connectedness. That's why Paul relates having hope to having, uh, to utilizing the spirit to be able to have hope. It takes hope to be able to hang on to the hope. It, it, uh, it takes the spirit to be able to hang on to the hope. It takes our ability to be able to walk in intimate relationship with Jesus Christ in order to grab hold of the hope so we never never lose it if we're just hanging on to it with our souls we'll lose it because our souls will get stressed out we'll get uh you know directed and uh, tired and weary and all those kind of things but when we are hanging on to the hope by the spirit that's when we can hang on to it and it's true of all of these in ephesians that that uh, the hope presence and power so back to ephesians Chapter one, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, the father of glorious power, the father of glorious presence, the father of glorious hope may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the intimate personal knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened by revelation that you may know the hope, again, by revelation of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, the riches of his presence. Remember when David said that he foresaw the Lord always before my face, that he would not leave his soul in hell? We see this, so we see this in the natural setting that David was able to hang on to the hope by always looking at the Lord before his face, even before the knowledge of the Lord like we have. But he was able to hang on to the hope, and that's what predicated so much of his, his walk and victorious uh, uh, lifestyle for God as king and prophet. In So the hope focuses the heart. And it ushers in the ability to walk in his presence. 
And that's why I believe his presence is the number two thing. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the hope and his presence, the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. And verse 19, finally, what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Now, here's what happens so many times with brothers and sisters in Christ is that they they grab a hold of the hope. They have an intellectual knowledge of it and they're they're walking it and excited about it and rightfully so. And and of course, then they, they want to get right to the power. And so the much of Christianity goes after people with power. But if we don't have presence sandwiched in between, then you have neither the the ability to to keep it in the race. You, nor do you have the ability to, to rise further because you can't get to power, the supernatural power, without the presence. You can't get to having to walking in the kind of uh, power that people long for, or, you know, we all want to raise people from the dead, heal the sick, all those things, but we can't get there as effectively and we can't get there uh, uh, consistently without having the presence of God from which to be our power base to get to the power of expression. So the presence of God follows uh, having the hope, and then the, what follows the presence is the power. So this is kind of interesting. You see, hope focuses the heart. His presence, his presence fills the heart, and his power releases the heart. You think about Moses and Elijah and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Joshua. You think about the Apostle Paul and Peter and John. What was common in all of them there was their connection. Now, the Old Testament, a little harder. New Testament, a whole lot easier. We can speak in tongues. We have the hope of the return, knowing that Jesus Christ came the first time. We have all of these things that enable us to keep running the race with, with a mindfulness and a relationship that they didn't have in the Old Testament. Yet they did some pretty good things. What happens is we try to skip right over to the power part from the hope part. And without the presence of God operative and, the, the, uh, and, and being a mainstay and the main focus, we wind up running out of gas. We wind up getting faint and weary. Sometimes we wind up losing the hope. And these are all things that, that require us to go to the Holy Spirit and say, teach me more about the hope. Teach me more about coming into his presence. Teach me more about operating your power. And so the true discipling, like we were talking about earlier, has everything to do with teaching people to connect with Jesus Christ on a personal level and thereby uh, uh, thereby continuing both in the hope and in the presence and, and in his power. There's such a launch pad of refreshing that the hope brings, but the real refreshing is, is, is in his presence. And so we see in, in Acts chapter 3, an, a, a tremendous, uh, I don't know, what happens in my heart when I read this, I just get so electrified because I think about what happens when we climb into his lap and just sit there. When we seek that better thing like Mary did. It says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And there's a curious word here. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. There are things that happen when you gain access to the throne room that have, may have eluded you for years and years and years. There's things that come together. There's, there's, there's avenues of power and presence and might and majesty and understanding and wisdom. These are all things that that when we just park and sit still before him, come to us that may have eluded us for a long time. There are times of refreshing. And in Hebrews chapter four, there's a expansion 
of what that fresh refreshing looks like. And here the author is talking about the rest that people are not using because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, chapter 4, verse 1, a promise being left of us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, with them that heard it. For we which have believed to enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the old. He's spoken a certain day about the rest on the seventh day. And then he goes on to say again, he limited a certain day saying in David, verse seven, today, after so long a time as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, that's coming into his presence. That's hanging out with him. Pardon not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, they, then they would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remaineth, or there is remaining, therefore. There is remaining to you and to me today. And there is remaining to you and I tomorrow. A rest unto the people of God, a Sabbath rest. And see, God wants us to hang out and rest in him, to enjoy his presence because he wants to be able to magnify himself through you. Uh, every every uh, day that Rita goes off to the hospital to work, we always pray that God's presence will fill her and will work through her and that the people that she ministers to in their hospital beds will be able to see the presence of God when they see her. And you know, God has a way of doing what we ask him to do. He has a way of doing these things in a, in a marvelous way. And God has a way of responding to every prayer that you pray. And if you ask God to increase his presence in you, and you spend the dwell time that you need to be in his presence, you'll be astonished at the power and the doors that God will open, the favor that will come to you, the things that will surprise you that will become easier than you've ever seen before. You'll be amazed at what God does when we start cultiv cultivating more of his presence. There remains, therefore, verse nine, a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from him. This is what astonishes me about the work in Africa and other countries is that it's not work at all. It's resting in the Lord, and the Lord opens the doors. It's an astonishing thing, and I, I, I just marvel at it, because God continues to open more and more and more. I, I wonder how we can keep going and doing, and then God keeps on opening another door. <laughs> he's, just, he's just amazing. I believe that the more we spend time in his presence, the more we'll accomplish in the day. It's paradoxical because the more time you spend not doing what you think you ought to be doing, it seems like how are you going to possibly get things done? But God has a way of wiring circuits and making the electricity to flow and getting work accomplished. God has a way of doing and, and orchestrating events and putting things in your path that enable you to be so much more efficient. Uh, you know, it used to amaze me, even way back when I was aboard ship in the Navy, that uh, so many times I'd know ahead of time something that was going to be required of me, and I'd go and do it, and it was all done. And, uh, you know, I'd be able to say, yes, sir, it's, uh, here it is. <laughs> or working in a, in a factory. You know, so many times I'd, uh, you know, again, God would put things in my heart, go do it or tend to it. And, and, and suddenly we averted a crisis because it was done. Uh, just puttering around the farm, you know, uh, go out to a, a barn that needs fixing. And you, uh, uh, you know, you ask the Lord, well, what tools should I bring? And, and he tells you all kinds of bizarre things, but you go do it and you find out that you needed those particular tools. You wouldn't have thought about by yourself. 
there's a there's a way of walking by the spirit and those that's kind of ridiculous silly examples but there's there is a a manner of life that has to do with communion in the spirit with the father and with the lord jesus christ and when we become quick at responding to those quick revelations that go across our radar screen when we are when we uh when we wind up obeying them, we discover that he's engaged. He is constantly doing things with us, through us, and in us in ways that we don't even recognize. And the more sensitive we become to the presence of the Holy Spirit within us, the more efficient we wind up doing the work that we have to do. You know, it, it, he's so portable. He's in us, the hope of glory. And so Paul is saying here again, Going back to Ephesians, some deep truths that ought to cause us to just marvel. Verse 17 of chapter 1, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the relational knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know the hope, his presence, and his power. The usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he energized in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power or literally authority, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. That's the place that he postures you to be able to function in this life when we are tuned into his hope, his presence, and his power. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness that is filling all in all. Glory to God. So we, we determine that we're going to stay enlightened in his, enlightened from the revelation from him, staying in his power, staying in, <laughs> sorry, staying in his, uh, in the hope of his calling, staying in his presence, and thereby walking in his power. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for your grace, your goodness, and your blessing. Thank you for the hope, for your presence, and your power, and giving us a revelation of each one of them so that we can maintain and build and, and launch and fly uh, with, with them. Thank you, Father, for your, your amazing way of working in us to will and do of your good pleasure. And thank you that we can be found faithful all the days of our lives doing the will of our Heavenly Father, always and only, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, through, his, through the revelation from him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. God bless you.